Each transaction, I output the distance from home location, which I'll calculate based on a formula with latitude and longitude for where I'm transacting the home location, and the transaction value. And then, after we've done all this data wrangling thing, that I, I myself, I don't like it. I'm more an app guy than a data guy. But once you do all the data wrangling, you basically just call up thing and say, hey, scale this for me, and then train a model, and output the result as a PMML. It's really simple. And the output, let's push this app now that I basically um, created. It's using the manifest file that I showed you and say, I'm creating this app with the name you told me to. This is the, my organization in space. I'm creating a route in my DNS server with the name you asked me for. I'm binding that route to the application so you can actually have multiple apps with one route. And then what you get is round robbing across different instances. I'm uploading that app and then done uploading. I'm binding that app to the Redis and the GPDB services you asked me to. So that's the time when it goes to the container, injects all the information. And then it's starting the app. And it looks, whoa, I'm creating the controller staging. Oh, it looks like it's a Java application. Oh, let me download the Java for you, the J Open JD JDK version X. That's what's configured. I could say Oracle JRE and point it to it. Oh, by the way, I'm also downloading, those are the memory settings that it told me to use. Oh, by the way, it's a Spring, so I'm also downloading the Spring reconfiguration profile. And then I'm uploading the droplet. I mean, I created the container, now I'm uploading it so it can create as many versions if you want. And then I'm starting one instance. Okay, one instance running, app started, and it's right here. And then I can do CF apps as you. So this is the process of pushing an application to Cloud Foundry. That's it. Now imagine that if you have one application, not only to realize this business, but, but also to the integration points, sources, destinations, transformation. That's what's happening underneath. Now that I have my app, um, this is what I was training before we got here. So this last training here took one hour, 53 minutes. I'm not doing it again. But this is the result. As I told you, I raised the application, but not Redis. Redis was there, so I'm still storing the method. And this is the last model I trained. It says a PMML, you have two fields, <coughs> inputs. Let's remember what those are, distance and transaction value. Those are the two inputs. And when you give me those, I will output you either cluster zero or index one, which has a high value High, it's very far from my home location. Is a medium high transaction value. That's what I want as high transact, high, high, high risk. There's one, for example, that is very close to home location. Those are all normalized values, of course. Close to home location and have a small transaction value. The other one is on a medium term. Still home is, is higher value. So this is my high risk transaction. This is what we're going to filter on when you build that pipeline. So all we wanted is actually an endpoint which has my trained model. It's fine, we got it. Now really simple. I have two applications in CF. One I showed you is the console, the, the baseline. The other one is the application that can train and apply back with the model trained. Now we're going to build our pipeline. We're going to build all this entire thing here. So let's start by looking at Spring Cloud Airflow, finally. This is Spring Cloud Airflow main interface. I have in the first tab my applications or sources, destinations, processors, which are components I can use to build the pipeline. You can see that they are all from a either a Maven or a GitHub repository. Because I want to reuse those things and be able to share it. Internally, you can point to a jar file. I just don't like to use it because a jar file is something location specific. So, prefer to point to a Maven repository, for example. All those come out of the box with product. And they have types like sources, 
sinks, distant processors. A better way to look at that, and if you want to connect to the shell, of course we have a command line shell because you might want to automate and script things, right? I can also do any autocompletes. I can do app list, for example. And okay, now it separates what sources, processors, and sinks, and see stuff available. Now I have all those applications registered, and I have nothing deployed. I can come here and start creating streams just by drag and dropping. You can say, well, let me start with an FTP, FTP source. And then I click, oh, and I'm going to start a stream that calls from FTP, and then I'm this is the file name that I'm going to ingest from these servers or local directory, whatever. So you can put all the configuration you wish. Then you, for example, after the file, I'm going to do some filtering. And you start connecting stuff. And as you look up, it's actually starting to build what we call a DSL, domain-specific language. That, of course, you can use to replay any of this, to script it or to recover or to do it again. So, so is, the, is the developer doing this? It's, I would say that it's the integration architect. Okay. Is the guy overseeing a lot of different applications for a specific, usually bigger use case, or the guy handling enterprise architecture? Or in this case, like doing this, usually the operation guy. One's going to create the flows and then deploy, undeploy, redeploy. It's again, it's like we have one person operating 10,000 applications, four for 40,000 applications. So it's, it just becomes simple. Once you build it once, it's simple. Um, OK. Last thing before we show everything working and understanding how it works, I told you that from one of the steps here, I actually needed to bring my own application to, to Spring Cloud Data Flow, my own Spring Boot app. And then I'm going to show you how we actually can do that. Otherwise, you're going to just see a bunch of apps some people created and it does not make sense. Uh, if I'm not wrong, I forgot to remove my application here, but I'm going to remove it to put it again so you can see it again. Yeah. You can see there's an enrich phase here. There's the only one that's not Oric Spring Framework Cloud Stream. That's the main repository. That's my one. I'm going to remove it and we're going to compile and register it again. Now there should be no longer an enrich here for me to create a stream. Processor, refresh. Okay, it's gone, bridge filter, it's gone. So I told you that the first step of that stream, just to recap, because there's a lot of information. First of step of that stream, after training the model, training and outputting that PMML, was that we're taking the information right out of Gemfire. And as information comes, first add a distance from home location variable to it. That distance from home location I already got from the training phase, if you remember. And I was asked the story in Redis. So this is one of those examples that I have two microservices that are actually sharing a Redis database because they actually needed that context. Otherwise, I need to compute that again. It's extra time. I don't want it. I want to just pull it off because I already had information. So I have just another Spring Boot app that is my enricher processor that if you look closely, how hard is this? Spring Boot application. That's it. With one main class which I'm using Redis. I'm binding it automatically. I'm going to use that distance from home location information. Uh, properties, which are on a separate file, but it's just a list of properties that you can use. And then two tags that identify this as just not a normal Spring Boot app, but a Spring called Stream or a data microservice. First of them, I just say this class can be a processor. So enable binding, this can be a processor. And then what I told you is on the method that we want to behave, 
as a data microservice, I'm going to say, I want those parameters coming from the standard input channel and the result to go to the standard output channel. That means that when I deploy this, Spring Cloud Stream will create a specific input channel in Rabbit and Kafka and Res, whatever you want, and a specific output channel. It's going to bind it together and make sure that every single thing you receive it's actually marshaled and unmarshaled between that and the application point. The results are done exactly the same and it's bounced to that service. And then from that, it's very easy. I get whatever is on my payload. I extract a bunch of information. What's the account? What's the device ID? I go to Redis and say, what's the location for that device? So I can know what the home location is. What's the home location? Then I basically calculate the distance. I get latitude, longitude. I calculate the distance again, and then I put on my payload, this is my home location in terms of latitude and longitude, and this is how far you are from it. This is a, that is an enricher. Anyone who's done a pipeline, this is just enriching with information coming from a different place. It's an enricher, traditional. And I just return it. I'm not saying I'm writing to this, to this queue, reading from this queue. Nowhere. There's no Rabbit MQ or Kafka information here at all. Once I go to that application, really simple, I can do, I can compile that, view that, and the install, if you're not used to Gradle, install is just a Maven plugin that will actually install it in your local Maven repository. So I can reference it when saying port this application, I, I basically show my local repository. It's been installed. It's installed. At that point, I can go to BDD flow. There's no enricher anymore. We do app list. There's no enricher anymore. I can say now register this app that the name is enrich. I want this as a processor. And this is the URL. And I'm giving my local main repository. Now, if I show app list, I should be seeing rich here, and now I'm able to drag and drop and make it part of my flow. That's it. Super simple. Like any Spring Boot app, those two tags, drag and drop, it's here. So now let's start that flow. Help me out here. Refresh. I should see an enrich right here. So we can start by JFAR. I'm reading information from Gem, if you remember that correctly. And I'm going to call this from gem. This enrich, just the start part of the flow. I'm reading from this host address. And if you're curious, that's my local IP. So I'm reading from my local gem file on the, transact on the region called transaction, where all those things are going. And that's it. And whatever comes out of that, and you see that the DSL here is being updated with whatever I put, whatever I get out of that, I want to enrich. And I connect, look at the DSL, it's building that for me. And whatever comes out of the enrich, I'm going to show you that I'm first enriching. So I want to show you some logging out of that. But not only show you the log, I want to take the result and run to that PMML evaluation process, which is that machine learning file. So I have ready here a PMML processor. It is not built by me, it is just supported. Then I can just tag it here. And then I can map and say, those two inputs that you have, field zero and field one, they are coming from this model, field zero and field one. I want to map to payload.distance and payload.transaction value. And then the result, show me the result, and we'll filter the result later. We could be building this the entire day. Thing is, if you already built it before and just want to redeploy it or run to iterate on it, 
You can always save the DSL, like I did here, for example, and paste it here. And there you go. The UI is really amazing. So let me walk you through that. We're reading from Gemfire on the transaction region. I'm going to enrich. I have no parameters. There was just that application that I tagged. But after enrich, I'm going to show you the payload that now has home location and distance. I'm going to tap out of whatever comes out of enrich. And I'm going to run a PMML evaluation. That's a critical one, so let's look at it carefully. I'm saying my model location is clustering service, local PCF that I know. That's my application slash hosting slash model PMML XML. That's the exact URL that we have here. So I'm consuming that model. And I'm mapping field zero was that input that I showed you to payload.distance. And I'll show you the payload.distance on region, of course. And the field one is the payload.values. So I'm mapping those two things of payload to the, what the model is expecting. And whatever comes out of that, I wanted to see a conversion to application JSON because I want to show you the result. You could come in binary, just show me the JSON because I want to filter and I want to show you what's coming out of that. So I'm going to show you the result of that model evaluation as well. It should say cluster one, cluster two, or cluster three. And then from cluster one to a tree, we're saving on a variable. And then my filter says, look at that variable. That, by the way, I'll show that it's underlying output or underscore output dot result. I'm only interested on the ones that say equals cluster one. In cluster one, if you remember pro correctly, it's this one here. It's our high risk cluster. Could be cluster three, could be two. In this case, it's one. I'm really only interested in cluster one. And whatever comes out of that cluster one, I'm going to inject back to Jane Farm on the exact same cluster, but now on the region called suspect, which actually my application is really. The most interesting part is not the flow itself. It's now you see the applications starting and behaving like any apps and making the flow work. So we're going to start by just deploying this thing. I'm confirming the string creation. At that point, it's going to look. It's going to look at my rabbit, and I'll show you how I specify its rabbit or Kafka later. It's going to look, it's going to see I have a rabbit available here. And it's going to start binding every single application, data microservice application, to that rabbit is automatically rabbit. And it's going to use rabbit as a transport layer. And we only have those two apps. Nothing bounds to rabbit. Rabbit is empty, as you see, bound app zero. So I'm going to create, it's going to create the channels, not deploy applications yet, but it's going to create the channels for me in Rabbit. Now my apps are here, my flows are here. I'm going to deploy the first one, which reads from Jamfire, enrich, and show you the log. So deploy. Here I could specify, out of the box, I want eight copies of that container, five of these, and by additional parameters, anything you want to pass on. I'm just going to hit the defaults. Deployment request sent. Now we'll do CF apps again. And we see new three, three new apps, which already have their own routes assigned, which are starting with, still have zero instances running out of one. But let's try it again. <coughs> now the three of them are starting. They have their names, which they have flow, name of my screen, and the step I'm referring to. Say they are all started. They have their own routes, if I want to access them directly. They now seem to be running. Let's check the logs to make sure they're up, right? This is Count Foundry streaming the logs for you automatically. They're still starting. <coughs> like container is up, so it realized the container is up. But string is still binding stuff. It should say application ready or container became healthy. Here we go. Seems that the first step of our streams are ready. And if I look at CF services now, let's look at that rabbit. 
Now that rabbit has data flow from Jamlog, data flow from Jenrich, etc., etc. By the way, I'm also binding them automatically to Redis, as you can see here. Both because I'm exchanging data in Redis between that clustering service and that microservice that I deployed, and also because if Rabbit is unavailable, it can switch to Redis. It's a fallback. They all seem to be running. Now let's keep tailing those logs right here, and I'm gonna start that training again, that emulator, that sends some data. We should see, we have time, right? So let's take one minute more, and I'll show you how the data is in Gemfire, so you can see exactly enriched. So let's connect to Gemfire directly. If you remember that I was using a host name that's mapped to my local IP, and I can show query. I'm going to show that region transaction you're consuming from. You're basically getting out of the ID, device ID, value, account ID, and has. There's no location information, no home address. Now I'll show you this plus what we are en enriching. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Let's start the emulator. Now we should not only see the green stuff popping up, but also some logs, interesting logs. Hopefully. It's adding the devices, we'll do some start adding the transactions. I'm gonna stop right here. Boom. Let's go back to that log. We see some stuff coming. So I told you that it would show what we had. ID, device ID, value, account ID, and timestamp. But it's now adding home location, which is a bunch of latitude and longitude, and distance from home location. You might notice that in purples, I'm generating a lot of transactions which are far from my home location. 700 kilometers, 1600 kilometers. I'm doing that to generate a lot of positive frauds, so you can see that. Otherwise, we need to stay here for like 20 minutes to see something happen. So we're gonna see a lot of frauds. Guess what? When you see those in the evaluation, most of them will map to cluster one because they are very far. And they, most of them are beyond $100 as well, a lot of them. They're gonna all map to number one because of that. Like, it's all uncertain in machine learning. It depends on how the other transactions are happening patterns. It changes every time you present. That's why I, I'm, I'm hitting very, very far uh, locations so we can actually make sure it's, it's a high risk. I didn't do anything, we deployed, the applications are running. That's running great. Let's deploy the next step. Next step, we're gonna basically get everything that comes out of that enrichment, as we showed you, and we're gonna run that PMML evaluation and log that out. Simple, so I'll show you those transactions going to cluster one, two, or three. Deploy. CF apps. Immediately two new apps right in the bottom. One of them is starting. The other one is also starting. Let me do some zoom here. And I'm gonna start taking a look at the logs of the log one so we know when it's ready. And why this starts maybe it's a good time to get any questions. So is that PMML the sync or PMML is just a standard for uh, machine, uh, the machine learning format, open source. Okay. Actually, let me see what's the official definition of PMML is. PMML Wikipedia. Predictive I mean, model your, markup language. In your slide, you have a component of PMML, right? Yes. So that's a sync or, or application? Right? That's an application. Let's do it again so you can see how the flow is. There is one step called PMML, which calls the PMML, which evaluates the PMML model. That's why it's called PMML. Every single step becomes an application called Foundry, right? So if you go back to CF, and the app is already running, we already have had results, I'll explain why. If you go to CF, 
you're gonna see there is one step called data flow evolve PMML in this application there's a storage running while we are shutting. Let's go back. I told you that once you create a stream, you already created the channels, right? That means those transactions that we tested first were already on the pipe, waiting for an app to start, consume them, and return the result. So for those transactions, we already have the result here. What you're gonna see is a lot of stuff I'm really not interested on, that's why I, I filter it. So now we have, for this last transaction, for example, not only the ID, device ID, value, account ID, home location, and that distance that was far, like 700 kilometers, that component, that PMML app, created for me a variable or an additional field called underscore output. And I said I wanted in JSON, right? So it has an output dot result cluster one. Output dot type, it was made on distance to the center of the cluster. And then a lot of machine learning specific things that I'm not concerned about. Cojone maps and arrays of similarities and covariances, I, I, I really don't care. I'm only interested on, are you mapped to cluster number one? Okay, you seem risky. That's all I wanna do. But for each transaction, you basically getting all this info from that app. Whatever. Now the next step of that pipeline would be, let's take all those transactions and I'm gonna apply a filter. That's a simple JSON filter. You can do with any JSON variable you want. I just want the transactions that come out of device ID 4. I'm just interested in transactions which value is higher than $120. You can do whatever you want. In this filter I said, I'm only interested on payload dot output dot result equals one. That's all I'm interested on. And I did a conversion to string, compared string to string, so it came long and double without me a mismatch. And whatever comes out, so only the ones who match one, I'm gonna write back to Gemfire to the transaction uh, region called suspect that the map is using to plot as red. So I'm gonna deploy this last step. As I deploy it and as the transactions come up, you're gonna see already some coming as, as suspect because they were already on the pipe, was the same way. But I'm gonna rerun the entire thing again so we can see that running real time. Can you go back to the diagram? Yes. Do you want here or do you want on this line? Well, you have your different flows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. As we write it. The just a second. Side, you have a lot of rectangles. Let me just see if the apps are starting. Okay, they are starting now. It might, get, it might get a bit slow because now I'm running Clowns Foundry, nine apps, Green Plum, Gemfire, Redis, and everything here. But let's, let's, let's go back to the diagram. It's only a Macintosh. <laughs> you see? Sometimes it seems gonna fly. It starts the fan so high, there's like, Okay, um, let's get the entire flow again, so I don't need to put that up. Yes, question. This is where you build your streams, and on the left-hand side, you, you use the title, Paul asked you who does this, and you call them a data integration? No, it's a integration. enterprise system integration general, or enterprise application integration. I cryptographic algorithms in a transform and say, take a value, produce a hash. Say it again. Okay. Um, I want to be able to take some data yep. and transform it. Mm -hmm. I want to create a hash value. Yeah. I want to take that. Yeah, yeah. I want to be able to take data and do a transform. It's a cryptographic transform. Mm -hmm. I want to do a hash value. Yeah. Store that. You can make that as just a microservice, write a Spring Boot app and make it part of any flow, then you can reuse it. So I can add yeah. blocks. Absolutely. Okay. Like I have the enrich, you can add whatever you want. All right. Um, so Ford, for example, is adding their own apps that basically ingest data from a sensor, do some training, using PMRL some stuff, do some evaluation as well. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they do some predictive maintenance scenarios. They're not allowed to share a lot, but they use this quite a lot. Yes? And this screen definition, Absolutely. So in the same way I'm doing it here, and I'm saving the SL, 
I could either do a script, and the script is going to be based on this, so the, you can actually run the script out of here. Um, and from here, you can also create stuff manually if you want. I can do stream deploy, undeploy, create, etc. And they're going to be all here. Of course, it's lines breaking, but you can do stream, create, it suggests you give you a name, and I'll give you a name, dummy, and then it says definition, and then, oops, and then it starts suggesting, oh, let's start with FTP. And what do you want as parameters? Oh, you can give all this. So, it, and it suggests why on the fly. It's pretty awesome. Yep? Monitoring resources. You had a slide as part of functionality of the system is okay. able to monitor. This, this Cloud Foundry, I'm, I'm not using our cloud, I'm using the local laptop. Right. So it's a local version of CF because it's gonna, not going to depend on network. But um, you can monitor, Cloud Foundry has monitoring tools and metrics tools for any container that runs inside it. It has its own metrics that captures uh, utilization of memory, CPU, whatever, and monitors the application, and monitors the container, recreates it if it's dead, etc. It plugs to monitoring tools, Do we have like app insight and, huh? huh? Do we have any documentation? Oh, tons, tons, tons. What I'm curious is how. If you Google for it, you like I, you know, I, I can, I can send you the docs, but you can find. Okay. What exactly? What's the inter what, what exactly? What point are you actually interested? Well, in? two aspects. One, I do want to know what's going on in the system. Mm -hmm. I want to record a benchmark as to what is normal behavior of the system, mm -hmm. and then tell me what is outside of that benchmark mm -hmm. parameters. Mm -hmm. Will they able to create that? Type so, of any monitoring out of the local metrics, any monitoring. Instead of building their own monitoring tool inside Cloud Foundry, right. the foundation, and just to understand, Cloud Foundry is a, it's an open source project, project hosted not only by Pivotal, it's a, there's a foundation of companies. That's, the, the, the definition of foundation is we're going to actually integrate external monitoring tools instead of trying to create our own. We have companies doing this for over 10, 20, 30 years. So we can integrate to anyone. So I'll give you an, just an example. Anything happening here, anything, is generating JMX data. You can connect to any monitoring tool and read the JMX data out of here. Start with that. You can connect to New Relic automatically out of the dashboard. Say New Relic monitors this. You can connect to App Insight, actually onboarding new other services. But anything is raw JMX data as well. Um, and uh, so just, just to give you a sight, um, this is not my laptop. This is a different cloud that we have on PWS. But you can take, okay, this, this, is, this development space only for this, this Dakota, has 31 running apps, 16 running, 14 paused, one down, 70 services. So the app, even if you click, let me see if any of those are bound to any new relics. There's a new relic service here. Oh, there's no app bound to it. Uh, basically, Blaze Media all do that. You can go to any of the services on the marketplace, and if you deploy that internally, you can make your own services available here. That's the public version of that. And for example, you can buy New Relic. There's a standard free plan here. Bind this to any application existing, and it starts going to that all at once. It's one of the things. Um, or you can actually just want to get metrics out of the basic metrics out of the app. You can click on the map, on the app, UPCF metrics. It's, there's actually pretty amazing info you can get from here. Let me see how much this application is accessed. I have no clue. Um, it's not. No application events. Um, you can see request, response, errors, latency, um, logs, and then I can change it where it is coming from the app, is onto routers, the self is the help of the app. Then you can start logging metrics, network, and I can enable container metrics. So CPU, memory. It's, it's really fun. Um, now that all the apps should be running for us, we have everything deployed, all the nine apps are here, we should probably resume. Oh, and I'm before sorry. I do that. Yeah. So for your monitoring tool, are you using Spring with the 
actuator or you have some other for monitoring tools again yeah you use um, we connect to external monitoring tools oh so you connect use, uh, like a agent for, uh, exactly agent. exactly we have actually agent last metrics which are the ones i showed you the other ones we basically when you build it a container we figure out if you bind the same way we figure out if you bind your application to postgres for example and we embed the jdbc postgres we along with the application we look to see if you're bound to new relic for example then we embed the new Relic uh, agent inside the container and we spin up. Okay. So I have a JVM, but now I have a new Relic container. Right. And if you, a new Relic agent. And if you buy that, when you create the app and say, now this not only uses Redis and Rabbit and this, and now uses App Insight. Now I get the App Insight agent and also the inside. All that staging. Oh. So it connects automatically and start reporting. Every, then you say scale to 10, 10 instances, all the 10 connect and start reporting. So it's, it works perfectly. I told you there was already probably some transactions on the pipe that would be shot at frauds. Although we haven't monitored the interface there here, I'm going to restart this now. I'm going to clean this up and restart the test so we can see that initial test now happening with that real time behavior. Let's run it again. And now you imagine that for each transaction is doing that enrichment. Mesh learning evaluation logs all along, filtering and inserting back, and then the application gets it back. So it's making sure the devices are there, starting the transactions. Some are green, a lot of red, of course. And then if we stop it right now, go back, still some laggers, that's it. So it's near near real time machine learning pipeline evaluation. Yep. Now when you say container stuff, so that Spring, that uh, basically Cloud Foundry runs in containers. How does that compare with, say, like Docker containers? Does it take advantage of Linux namespaces? Are they truly isolated containers in the, in the classical sense? Or? Truly isolated. The thing is, um, we started this technology much before Docker did, mm -hmm. in fact. And we're, Docker is now part of Cloud Foundry Foundation. So they're the one of the ones that are actually working out with us for defining the standard for the platform. They're part of it. We're working together. We donated them a lot of work that we've done in the containers. They okay. improved it a lot. They work with us together. And there are two ways you can actually deploy an application called Foundry. You can do what I told you, like point to the search code of the binary, it figures out. And based on your operations team's uh, rules, which is I'm only supporting, let's say, Java and PHP. I don't want .NET. If you try to push anything other than Java and PHP, say you don't recognize this application. For Java, I'm only supporting JDK 7 point something or A.x. And only this framework here, and this. so we can actually lock what you're supporting, what your build packs are. Mm -hmm. And then it builds the container for automatically, so it's good for both from operations and control the point of view from a development point of view. If you prefer just to push your Docker container, hey, confound you, run this container, and you give it a container image from Docker Hub, mm -hmm. it deploys on Zaxman. Oh, so we can use a mix of Similar. So it's true process, Yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this was pretty much what we showed um, in Spring 1. And um, at the end, we're showing people how to actually create those full data integration and enterprise integration scenarios without much source codes and basically programming on the business part of the services. Show this integrated on an application that can actually deliver context. And then we actually say, well, once you have this, this is the kind of efforts architecture the industry walking towards. It's basically a kind of platform, like everything open source. It's a platform that allows you to deploy software consistently and quickly, regardless of the infrastructure. I'm running my laptop. The one I showed you after is running on AWS. Uh, a customer is running on, on Azure. The other one is going on Google. Doesn't matter. Confound works across that. There's no place to say it's Amazon. You have the first layer, your business microservices, where basically Java applications in general, if you're using Spring Boot or any other technology, you know, there's a Java user group. So let's imagine Java applications using Spring that you basically program the business part of what we need and it figures out how to start a container, how to listen to a port, how to route the requests to the methods you want just by annotations and ingesting any dependencies. 
that Redis connection, green plum connection, Jake forever, just say I need something here. Side by side of that, you have what we call data matrices, which are also applications and containers running the exact same platform. So again, all the benefits. You have the consistent logging, metrics, monitoring, restarting, high availability, all this across the board. But those apps are actually specifically targeted towards moving data from one side to the other and orchestrating different microservices. So you can call a legacy application out of a, a RESTful endpoint, for example, or out of a JMS queue, request to send, for example. You can connect to a JDBC server that you have as a legacy. It's going to reach some data coming out of your existing Oracle database. But you can always connect new microservices, new services, and make this orchestration all across the board. More important than that, you have flexibility on how you want to move the data from one service to the other because you have that independence on the transport layer. I'm using Rabbit here. Customers, most customers are using Kafka in production. We have customers that are using Rabbit in development. You, you have that flexibility. You can actually build your own. So we have a customer exactly working with us on building an active MQ as a JMS based resource to that. And then you can actually make this information context like deliver insights back to your microservices like we did today with this kind of environment. Okay, it's all I, I had to present and to talk to. Yes, please, question. One question. Yes, <laughs> just one. <laughs> right, so. Top of the time. <laughs> It tries to push and say it's it's need a service called Redis and you don't have it. So it's deployment. Yep. Yeah. So the other question is it sounds like uh there are services based on different technology and cohesive. Oh absolutely. In the same region. Right? I'll tell you the story about Cloud Foundry. That's the last thing I'm gonna tell. <laughs> Cloud Foundry for some reason it was developed inside Pivotal Labs. Pivotal Labs was originally a Ruby or Rails shop, which kind of weird for an enterprise application, right? But some of the components were actually built in, Ra in Ruby initially. So the router was initially in Ruby, for example. We had components in Java. We, dis we started to refactor part of Confounder to be more performant in Go. So now the router runs in Go. There's still a stager that we replaced last version that was still in Ruby. We have a lot of stuff using Spring. And actually, a lot of the .NET integration pieces are actually running .NET now. So it's really a polyglot environment. One final question. In production, can we keep the uh, services running when we have the Confoundry Yes. I, the same way I just deleted my app here, for example, I can update Cloud Foundry. The services are still running. Or you can update the, the services with all downtime. You can actually have, for example, two VMs of Redis. While you update one, you drain all the access to the other one or three, and you can do the rolling upgrades. Or you can just... The platform for you. The platform itself. What, what's the question about the platform itself? Can you do it? I'm not sure if I got it. Yeah, if I need to update the platform itself. Yes. So let's say you need to update the platform. The platform is a bunch of distributed components. It can be written in different languages, running different things, right? What means update the platform? Depends. You might want to update an operating system version that all the VMs are running on. So you're going to do a rolling upgrade per component. You can update the software that runs specifically in the cloud controller database, for example, with supposed to SDB, but you to upgrade that version. So you can do that to deploy a new cloud controller DB. In essence, that, that's a single instance. Very few components are single instance cloud foundry. Uh, because that's a single instance. In that a minute, for example, they're updating, you cannot push new applications. But you can still, your old applications are still running because they're completely separate part of the system. Just cannot push new ones. The cloud controller, it's on maintenance. You can get that if you try to push an application. It says, try again in a minute. We are doing maintenance and cloud control. You can do that. Or you can deploy multiple versions and do rolling updates. So platform update depends on many things. But we all do them, usually rolling update, no downtime, 
if you follow all the best practices with this no single instance com uh, component, etc. Et et so basically, what you're seeing based on how high and then risk this is? Yes, absolutely. We used to say that we have five high availability levels. I can talk better about that later. But you can lose VMs when we start. You can lose containers. I kill a container here, it will start automatically. I can kill the VM that the container is running on, and Bosch, that's our orchestration tool, recreates the VM again, different place. Same infrastructure. I can go there and kill a cluster itself, and we deploy multiple clusters. So we have what we call availability zones. It can be availability zone in AWS, it can be multiple clusters in vSphere, for example, and multiple hard racks, right? And I can kill a complete zone or system and have it dispersing the load between different zones. So one is out, the other is on. And last, I can have multiple sites connected to what we call WAN gateway using Gemfire. Gemfire replicates that information. So we can actually, most of our high-end enterprise clusters, uh, customers are deploying a site in New York, a site in San Francisco, a site in Chicago, for example. Yeah, they can have high availability with the sites. A little bit more complex when you get to that point. The auto replications, network latency, a lot of, lot of in interesting decisions to make, to trade-offs. But used to say that we can get high availability from the container level up to the site, multiple site level. So it sounds like the orchestration tool runs is very decoupled from the individual Completely container. Completely decoupled. Okay, so you can update the conductor and the tubas and the violins to keep playing. So, so Pif.com found we use what we call Bosch to deploy. Okay. It's an open source orchestration tool for distributed systems that we build for deploying Cloud Foundry. Mm -hmm. But you can build to deploy anywhere you want. Uh, however, you can deploy that using your own script if you want. You can do Cloud, cloud formation script to deploy to the last one. No need to use Bosch. So it's the couple. But Bosch, we monitor the VMs, we restart the VMs, we deploy to multiple sites, we do all that. Very interesting. Okay. Hey, thank you, Fred. Thank you. Thanks for having me here.